but I would say, I'm done now. I want to come home. There were a couple of occasions that I don't think my family realized till they read my first book, that I would go into the kitchen and take the butcher knife out and pull my little shirt up. I'd like to welcome to the show, Margo McKinnon. How you doing, Margo? Hello, Alex. Nice to meet you. A pleasure to meet you as well. I'm excited to talk to you about uh, your your interesting life, to say the least. Uh, some near-death experiences, some spiritual awakenings, uh, some amazing books that you've written, and things that will hopefully help our audience. So my first question to you is, what was your life like before you had these near-death experiences, which apparently was pretty interesting in its own right. Well, thank you for saying so. Um, my near-death experiences happened when I was 18 and about 37, 38. Okay. okay. Um, so I had two. And if we go back in my life, I always had this deep voice that would speak to me as a child. I saw spirits, I could hear voices. And it wasn't until I got older, I realized these voices were telling me what was going to happen, mm -hmm. uh, giving me premonitions and, and showing me like a vision moving forward. Um, so the very, you know, I always say the very first time I remember that voice coming in, I was about four years old. And we used to have this house on the beach in Cocoa Beach, Florida, and we were little kids. So um I used to, uh, I was surfing. Okay. So I was about three or four and I was surfing and I fell off my surfboard. And because of my height, I, I kind of, I fell off, but the waves were coming over my head and I didn't have the strength and the, and the tide was taking me back out or whatever, you know, and I was going this way and I was drowning. And I could see my parents, like the water was just up to their knees. But for me, it was like up here and I was drowning. And then suddenly I heard this voice that said, with the neck, it was always this deep voice, with the next wave that comes over, let it push you down, then dig your toes into the sand and push yourself back onto the shore and let the wave carry you back onto the shore. And I got onto the shore. It really did work. And uh, I sort of looked with my little scrunched up face to my parents. Didn't you see I was drowning over there? But I realized that this voice has always been there protecting me in my life. And now, even when I feel like I'm drowning, like metaphorically speaking, I say, no, just dig your toes in and let it bring you onto the shore. Don't fight it. Just bring, let it guide you onto the shore. So I was about, through, were you going to say something? I was going to, I was going to ask you. So when you were younger, the concept of spirits and voices talking to you, that was not, it was just part of your existence. It wasn't even a strange thing. It's, you thought everybody would do this early on, right? Yeah. It wasn't until I was 16 years old, Alex. Oh, wow. That I found out because I had very nurturing parents. And we also have it as part of our family culture. My uncle, uh, he haunts the armory in Kingston, Ontario, and he's been written, he he, he died in World War II. Uh, and he, um, he haunts the armory and people see him. I used to see him too, when I was like a high school adolescent. Uh, I used to see him, but that's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. But I used to see him, he's written up in the newspaper, my grandmother used to see a spirit. He came to tell, tell her they had, that he had passed um, in France. And um, so it's part of our family culture. There are just some of us who have it. So my parents were very good. My mom, so my grandmother on my mom's side and my dad is an engineer. So he always took a little more like, but he was always really open to, my dad was an incredible father and my mom was so supportive. So she really helped me. And, you know, I have my PhD in uh, from Oxford on the idea if we brought spirituality into public education, what would a model look like? Mm -hmm. um, and in my research, my lit review, when they talk about children, uh, how important it is not to dismiss their experiences. Mm -hmm. Because then the child, because that experience is more real to them than anything physical and tangible. So they 
children grow up not knowing what is real and not real. So it's important not to necessarily explain it to your child, but just to ask a lot of questions. And as we move along, I'd like to introduce some of the stories from me raising my own kids, uh, because my kids, you know, it's showing up in them as well. Now they're adults now, but it showed up in them as well. But if we go back to this childhood experience of mine, now I'm four, I've moved to Quebec City. I'm Canadian. Mm -hmm. I moved to Quebec City. And I'm putting my little doll, Michael, to bed. I have his crib in the living room. I'm about four. I'm tucking his little blanket up. And I hear, just out of nowhere in the dark, I hear, you are to be a teacher. And I, my little kid self said, okay, I will. And I became a high school teacher. And I could see some of the high school kids really struggling with, they were having spiritual experiences, but there wasn't a place in our school system for them to understand their experiences. Mm. I did it because I was a high school English teacher. And uh, because we talked about Macbeth, Hamlet, you know, Hamlet sees a ghost on his father's spirit on the top. Mm -hmm. We would have conversations about that in the classroom, but invariably, They would say, are we allowed to have these conversations here? I think that's sad, Alex. It is. It's really, really sad that kids, because they think about these things, they wonder about them. But where do they have a chance to explore them? How do they get the tools? And it shows like yours now that's giving people tools to navigate their own spiritual experience of life. So I I really appreciate and value what you're doing. Thank you so much. Um, So I heard this voice when I was a little kid. But as a child also, I knew I was a spirit trapped in a body. And I used to lie on my bed, my little kid's self. And I was kind of an ethereal little kid, like the wind could blow me away. And I'd lie on my bed and I'd go, I'd talk to the spirit world. And I'd say, how long do I have to do this all like forever like this? breathe. How long do I, when do I get to go home? When do I get to go home? Like, how long do I have to stay here? (laughs) And you know, when, when I've been listening to your show, and we hear near death accounts about people, they go home. And I knew that as a child, this wasn't my home. My home was over there. When do I get to go home? And this is a little ethereal little kid. So we can move forward. And I, I, uh, I remember I was about eight years old playing in my living room and I heard, die, breast cancer, 36. Oh, you'll miss your mom. I thought I was going to die of breast cancer when I was 36. Mm-hmm. I didn't set up my retirement until after I was 36, Alex. But anyway, <laughs> I should have I mean, thought, what's, the point? what's the point, right? Yes, yeah, so I thought, what, like, yeah, I don't need anything like that, right? But I, I was wrong. Here I still am. But um, so my dad came in and he said, what are you crying about? And I said, well, I'm going to die when I'm 36 of breast cancer. The voice told me because, as I said, I had parents that listened to my visions, you know, and really helped. Like my mom used to, because uh, I used to see spirits at night and everything, and I'd wake up and they'd be looking at me and that. And so she'd say, uh, like, or do they go behind your curtains? Look under your bed, look in your cupboard. So we do a whole suite. And I said, well, the problem is they come when everybody goes to sleep. But anyway, um, my dad said, you're too little to worry about dying when you're 36. But it always kept inside me, right, that I'd heard this. And it, as it turns out, my mom passed away of breast cancer when I was 36. So in your near-death experience, when people are telling their stories, they often talk about a blueprint Mm -hmm. and that we were born with some sort of a blueprint. And I think with my mom, because she ended up with breast cancer, was that just her destiny was she was going to pass away at 66 and I was 36. So do we have a day that is that day? I think we have some days 
that we can overcome, we can change our circumstances. What from do you think un- about that? From my understanding, I feel that I've been told and from, from many conversations I've had is that we have multiple out points. Mm. We have multiple exits that we can choose to go out in or not to go out in. And many of these are these near-death experiences that they come in. I'm like, okay, this is one of your outs. Do you want to leave? You can. Or if you want to go back, you can. It's your choice. So there are these kind of outs that we we have along the path. There, you know, mm-hmm. obviously sometimes they're hard outs <laughs> that you have no choice in the matter. Yes. Um, you know, at least no choice here in the matter. That's just the end of the blue, the, the end of the uh, the agreement, if you will. But yeah, I think there is multiple outs. Again, sometimes for different for different souls, depending on the blueprint. It all depends on what the soul is trying to achieve in this life. Mm-hmm. That's my experience. So if it's to be in and out in 12 months, in and out in 12 minutes, in and out in 120 years, it's it really is dependent on what the soul is trying to achieve either within themselves or for the people around them. And that's kind of gotten that my I, that's what I've kind of gotten from the multiple conversations I've had in this on this topic. I would agree. I would agree because when I taught high school, I did have some students because they really trusted me, mm-hmm. and I took my I took because the universe told me God Creator Oneness told me I was to be a teacher. I took that like so seriously. I knew that I was a some sort of an instrument and I took it really seriously, but I did have some kids who it, they wanted an out. They wanted to go home. But so you, I had to try and talk to them about that. Well, let me ask you this because this is very interesting. You know, we were all kids. We were all teenagers. You were a little bit different. You had a little bit more knowledge and understanding than most. Mm-hmm. Um, but I understand those thoughts because when you are an adolescent, when you are teen, teenage, it's a horrible time. It really can be just a horrible, horrible time. Body's changing. You really don't know what's going on. The ego is kind of really, you know, starting to take control. And and, and there's a lot of things that are happening during that time period. If you don't have the proper guidance or the proper people around you kind of got, and even with the proper people around you, it's tough to even break through uh, that time period. But I understand that. But I I do truly believe, and I was talking to a neuroscientist the other day about this um, on the show in regards to what our brain, how our brain functions when there's faith in it. Not religious faith. It can be religious faith, or it could be spiritual faith. Whatever faith, faith in something larger than yourself, those, uh, those souls seem to have an easier go of it. Because they they are they kind of understand that there's something larger than themselves. When you think you're it, it's just a difficult road. This is a difficult game to play. If you think yes. you're the only, if you if you think I am in control of everything, everything is either happening to me because I have bad luck or this or that, or it's a very difficult go. But when you open your awareness up to a larger awareness it becomes an easier road. So I think that ch- children and adolescents who have a spiritual path, either re- religious or spiritual, they have an easier run of it. And I did go to Catholic school and they were obviously went through, through, through struggles, but understanding that there was a larger picture helps tremendously. I don't know how you feel. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a, a, a new idea to add to your collection of ideas that you're putting together in your podcast. I told you about that a voice came in and told me I was to be a teacher. Okay. I also saw spirits. I heard voices. Okay. Um, I, I wondered about do, how long do I have to stay here? But I also had this kind of longing to go home. And I came from quite a lovely family. Right. Right. Like that. Like, how does this get explained, right? So they'd be downstairs watching TV. I'd come up to tuck my little doll, Michael, into his bed regularly, a very loving little nurturing child. And uh, But I would say, I'm done now. I want to come home. There were a couple of occasions that I don't think my family realized till they read my first book, that I would go into the kitchen and take the butcher knife out 
and pull my little shirt up and start and go right in here. Like there's no explanation. I'm not in any duress. I don't come from a family of abuse or anything. And I've put this knife up there and then I hear that voice. Put that back. <laughs> you are to be a teacher. I really think the universe gave me my purpose in life to keep me here. I don't think I'd be here, Alex, if I didn't have that, just like what you're saying. If I didn't you, have that voice, I would be out of here already. But you were, I mean, you're a unique study because you were very connected to spirit early on. And even young children are much more connected than, you know, the, the, the more, the longer you, you spend time in the simulation, if you will, the game, if you will, you become more and more disconnected from source. And then it's our job to kind of forget everything we've been programmed with to try to find our way back to source. That's kind of the purpose of life in many ways is to go back to source. But you were just like, why am I, what's, what's the point of all of this? You couldn't yes. see, you couldn't see more than one step ahead of you in many, in many directions. You couldn't see the well, larger yeah. picture because you were four, for God's sakes. I was four, <laughs> four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. Okay. So when I'm 16, let's, let's move ourselves forward to 16. I'm sitting in an English class. She brings out that we're going to study this book. And in this book, it's a historical fiction. They used to believe in ghosts and God. And, and it's because they were uneducated. Oh, That's okay. why they believed in that, right? And I was not a person in class that would actually raise my, I kind of like self-taught. Like mm -hmm. I probably would have done well as a student during COVID and doing all my stuff online. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, and I put my hand up and I said, well, what do you mean that they saw spirits and, and uh, had visions and everything because they were uneducated? Ghosts are real. Can't you see them? They're everywhere. Oh, God. Because my world looked like sure. a cocktail party. Like I, I was a child who had to learn, like, is this a real person? Is this a spirit person? I'd talk to them out loud. My older sister, we used to share a bed when I was a little wee kid. And uh, she said, you used to scare me so much because you'd say, well, how are we supposed to get to sleep with all these people in our room? <laughs> She said, I, I remember her diving under the covers and I'd get under there too, not knowing why, but ooh, there's something going on. But that was my reality, right? Sure. And there are a lot of people who have that reality. But in that moment when she said that, I sat back in my chair and I said, someday I'm going to go to a very prestigious university and I'm going to show that people who have this are highly intelligent. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the University of Oxford and I did my PhD there. So I had a life, uh, I think a blueprint that we were talking about that tells me that I have to keep bringing uh, legitimacy to this field. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why I really enjoy you. You're bringing really legitimate people onto your show and legitimate, right? Like they've worked hard, they've studied, they speak elegantly about their, their experiences. Um, and so, okay, so that's 16. By 18, I'm at university. I mm -hmm. have my first near-death experience, mm -hmm. which to me, I think, it, because I didn't have a near-death and it became my big opening into the, it was just another one of many of my Another life. chapter, another chapter. Yeah. <laughs> so I was very sick. I had strep throat and uh, apparently I'd had mono from kissing too many people. But anyway, when I went off to university, <laughs> So anyway, I ended up with this strep and I had such a high fever and they put me down in this dorm. Uh, it was called an infirmary at the bottom mm -hmm. of my uh, residence. Mm -hmm. And this student nurse was supposed to be looking after me. Well, anyway, she said to me, hey, Marco, listen, I, I, was, I had this date tonight with this guy. I just wanted to go out with him forever. And he asked me out for tonight. And here I am having to look after you. <laughs> and I said, well, sorry about that. Well, just go out on your date. Don't worry about me. I'm just here. I can't even get out of bed. I'm that sick. And she said, well, you have a phone here. I'm going to call you at like nine o'clock. Okay. So away she goes, I have a dream. Mm -hmm. So I'm going out and, I, and I'm heading to this beautiful orange free, wah, yeah, freedom, loving it. You mm -hmm. know, you're typical. And then I thought, oh, I need to say goodbye to my roommate. So I thought I better, so I'm in the basement. So I'm coming up, I'm on the ceiling. I'm coming up through the staircase and I see all the girls 
lined up and they're in ball gowns and they're waiting for taxi. So I'm on the ceiling and I'm looking down. And I said, oh, you girls all look beautiful. You're heading out somewhere. And then this one girl looked at me and I did a little somersault in the air. And I said, you've seen your first ghost. And then I came, went up and I went through the door and my roommate wasn't there. And so I said, sorry, got to go. And then I woke up. And then soon after my nurse uh, arrived on the scene from her date. And she said, I called you over and over and you didn't pick up. I thought you were dead. And I said, I think I was like, were the girls going somewhere? Yeah, they were going over to the military college for a ball tonight. And I said, I saw them. And she said, you couldn't have seen them because you're you can't even get out of bed. So anyway, that was my first one. Uh, so that sounds it, like so that sounds a little bit more out of body experience than near death, or is it kind of a combo, a little bit of both? I think that's well, you know, I think there's some, you know, okay. So I've been watching your show, and I'm listening to the near ex- and other near death experiences on other shows. I don't remember my dreams, maybe three a year, mm-hmm. but I'm listening to people's near death experiences, and I'm going. I had a, that's my dream. Mm. That was my dream. And you know, when you're supposed to come in and you're supposed to have forgotten your blueprint. Mm -hmm. But now I realize those are my dreams. I'm going over there. I'm going over to the other dimension in my dreams. Sure. So now that I've realized that out from your show, Alex, thanks a lot. <laughs> I'm going to start really studying my dreams because oh, yeah. usually they're they're wiped from my memory when I get up. But they're always something like that. So I had that one. Um, but I thought that was interesting because our curtains were orange in my infirmary. So I went to orange light. Okay. I used to have a recurring dream when I lived in Cocoa Beach, Florida, that I was like in the water and I was like a fish and I could... <sighs> breathe the water. And I, somebody was talking about their near death, that they were in water and they were breathing. And I thought, I, oh, yeah, that was my recurring dream. Exactly that. Hmm. So I think I'm having these, I'm going over to the other dimension in my dreams. So, so I'm going to so, study that now. So, so your sec, so let's go to your second uh, near death okay. experience. So what happened? So here we, okay. So we're going to go over here. I was doing an indigenous ceremony. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go into the ceremony because we're not supposed to talk about these ceremonies but I had one in there. Sure. So anyway, I'm in there. It's a, like a fasting one. I'm on my third day, no food or water. So I'm there. And then suddenly I just draw. Okay. And it was like this. I came, my spirit came right up and I could feel, I went up and I saw the pure white light And then my mom came down and my mom had this smile because, you know, she passed breast cancer like two years prior to that. She had this smile that went like this and her Mm -hmm. smile was like this. And, uh, and she was there and I could see these other spirits. They look gray to me, but they were on their way up. And I was on my way up like this. And I met my mom and she, she said, I love to see you, but you can't come any farther than this. Mm. and uh, so I was like and you know typical but I had kids little kids I had to come back down but the experience of that absolute unconditional love and joy and freedom and then my friend said Margo which is how you call a spirit back in by the way Mm -hmm. if they go that way you just call their name real hard like that and chances are their spirit will come back in. So she, and I went like this. And then I kind of looked around. I had to, oh yeah, who am I? I'm a person. Like I had to settle my spirit back in. I'm a person. What's my, my, and then I hear that voice coming. You're Margo. You're the teacher. So my purpose in life has always like been my anchor to keep me here. Mm -hmm. So I had that one. So then I decided after that one, okay, because you see, you hear people with their near-death experience and they take on whatever they learned as their kind of mission moving forward. Mm-hmm. And I learned, it really showed me about this unconditional love and peacefulness. And I thought, I am going to construct my entire life around unconditional love and peacefulness. So I'm going to go back into my classroom and this is going to be a space 
where young adolescents can learn in absolute unconditional love and peacefulness. And I used to get some real hardcore behavioral kids into my class because I was good working with them. Like they came from really, really tough circumstances, right? So they didn't really know how to behave, but they'd be dropped into my class because they, the, my, even my school knew about all my experiences. Really? Oh yeah. I, I, like you can't know me for five minutes out. <laughs> when are you saying my, something? <laughs> you know, you can't know me. Like I, when I wrote my first book, which was this one, uh, my dad said, you better not tell you about your experiences because you'll commit academic or career suicide. But you can't know me for five minutes that you don't know this about me. So everybody at school knew this and, you know, and they knew like because I could help kids in the classroom. So I'd get these kids and it was almost for them like I loved them so much. And I said, I don't care what you did. What I want to know is what you learned. Tell me what you learned. So it was like for them, now I realize, it's kind of like a really nice uh, life review. Mm -hmm. What have you learned? doesn't matter, good or bad, right? It's what you learned. And when, and you talked about high school being a hard place for adolescents. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I wanted, because of my near-death experience, I wanted it a space where they could grow into the people they want to be no matter where they came from. So we fast forward now two years. I, I'm taking my master's degree class because my uh, professor, my uh, school jurisdiction wanted me to become a principal. So I go get my master's degree. I took one class that was just for myself and it was called philosophy of mind. I wasn't doing anything to do with spirituality for my master's thesis. I was doing professional growth and organizational mm -hmm. culture. Doesn't that sound like a nice uh, oh, mastery yes. kind of thing? Yes, yeah. it does. <laughs> it does. So I took one class for myself and the homework assignment was, how are the body, mind, spirit related? Well, I did what I do all the time, Alex. I went home. I have a system. I have to clear everything. Like everything has to be shiny and uncluttered for me to get my visions. So I went onto the couch and I said, okay, I'm ready now for you to come in, that guide that tells me you are to be a teacher, dig your toes in, mm. let the wave run. I asked. And this massive, like I'd, I'd only heard the voice, but this time I saw, and it was this massive figure in my living room. So excited I asked. Bubbling with excitement that I asked. I wrote everything down. It said... We have not just three, we have five dimensions of self. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's my second book. You have five dimensions of self. It actually started with oneness, mm -hmm. but I'm going to start over here for clarity reasons, and then I'll explain how this works after. Mm -hmm. We have a body, but your body is your body, but it's also your material surroundings, anything material, physical mm -hmm. material. Mm -hmm. You have a mind. It's your logical, rational self. It's the one that's system. It does your taxes. It helps you buy a house, <laughs> right? Sure. Pay a mortgage. Then you have a spirit self. That is, that is your self that came from absolute unconditional love came down to earth to have an experience, we'll go back into unconditional love. Okay. It's eternal. I was surprised because I've always heard people saying spirit mm -hmm. and soul as like the same thing. Read my mind. Like, yeah. yeah. And it said, no, I said, soul, like I'm, I talked to my, this figure, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, because I can ask any question. I don't need to be in a near death experience to access that voice. And I said, well, I always thought spirit and soul were the same thing. And it said, no, your soul is your purpose. It's your reason for coming down here. This is your connection. This is you. It's your eternal self. It's the one that did a little somersault in the air and said, you've seen your first spirit. Mm -hmm. um, but your soul is your purpose. It's your, you are to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. It's the anchor for why you want to be here. 
And I suspect, Alex, because you've called your podcast Next Level Soul, that you're really exploring this side of yourself, like this is opening up in leaps and bounds, Mm -hmm. and you're diving into your soul purpose and expanding it. Okay. Oneness is connection and belonging, but it's your, it's the white light from the other side. It's God, creator, universe. It's part of us. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have five dimensions. We're born dominant in one of them and we grow the others over time. This is what it was telling me. Body dominant. They love the physical, physical experience. They love the hair, makeup, nails, fashion, sports, like especially those sports like rugby and -hmm. like those body ones where you have to sweat and everything, football, hockey, okay, body dominant, love food, setting Mm -hmm. a table. I, I'm not a body dominant person. I'm a, I could say I'm a body competent person. Mm -hmm. And I've only risen to the level of competence. It used to be worse. Like before I ever I wrote this book, uh, it was I wasn't very good at the body dimension of life because I was so ethereal. Um, mind dominant, love the logical, rational systems. And I'm saying our school systems are too mind dominant. Mm-hmm. It values mind dominant skill sets. The mind-dominant kids get to rise to the top and go to university. Then they get the jobs, and now they're running everything. And I would like to see our school systems bring these ones in Mm -hmm. because we have spirit-dominant students. And I would say I'm a spirit-dominant, but I'm almost almost equal now, spirit and soul-dominant. But as a spirit-dominant person, I value unconditional love and peacefulness more than anything else. My spirit looks out at a world. And when I look over here, I have I live in a condo and I have full on city views. So I see all the big high rises and I live in an oil and gas town. Um, so my eyes look out at a world that is unnecessarily harsh and abrasive. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be like that. And now I realize that's why as a little kid, I want it to go home. I want it to go back where it was kind and we were loved. And spirit dominant people, they remember that love, Alex. Mm -hmm. Like they, they remember it and they long for it. They miss it. But can you get that longing or being more spirit predominant later in life? I think you can. I think that's why when people have these opening up experiences and it can start because we all have all five. Mm -hmm. So when I had kids, I was showing this to my class when they, uh, when I came up with it and I said, Hey, you guys, guess what? I just came up with this and I drew it out on the board and I was showing them. And it was these kids who stayed after school. Hmm. And they said, you're talking about me. It's like you read everything that's been going on in my mind. They want to go home now. They're lonely. And I was a spirit dominant person. I say was because this book helped, whole model helped me. So my first book was called The Exquisiteness of Being Human. And I wrote that because at, when I invented this, when I came up with this in my master's degree, degree class, when that figure came in, my guide came in and told it to me, I was so lonesome to go home. Mm. And I remember looking at my sister. I was visiting her in Stowe, Vermont. We were in this, we were hiking in that. And she she loved hiking. I'm not body and dominant enough to love that, but I go anyway. <laughs> She's body dominant. <laughs> So anyway, she's on the couch lying there under this Afghan in this kind of rental house, drinking tea out of somebody else's cup, Uh, you know, and she's lying there and she she goes, Margo, tell me about your life. How's it going? Tell me everything. I'm sitting, Alex, just barely touching the chair because I'm thinking, how can she be so comfortable under somebody else's 
Afghan drinking out of somebody else's cup. Spirit dominant people are so sensitive. They're porous people. Mm-hmm. They can sense the what whose lips have been on that glass before, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. whose body's been under that Afghan. They can feel it. And I was barely touching the chair and I, th- I looked at her and I thought, oh, I know the difference between you and me. You're at home everywhere and I'm at home nowhere. Mm-hmm. And that's why I decided I'm going to find the exquisiteness of my life. I am going to make earth my home. And I mm-hmm. went about doing that. Now I'm so excited about it. I painted my whole condo out white so that it matches my near-death experience of going into the whiteness. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I have my home into that sanctuary space of unconditional love, peacefulness. I created my whole classroom around unconditional love, peacefulness, where people can grow into their real self, where the students can create the life their spirit wants to live. Well, let me ask you this, because we have mm-hmm. these five dominant uh, personality profiles, mm-hmm. if you will. How do you balance the five? Because we have all five. And, have and, all five. and in this you know, simulation game experience, we have to deal with all five, no matter even if you're the highest of spiritual beings, ascended masters or soon to be ascended masters still deal with body and mind in this, still deal with ego con- differently than you and I do. Mm -hmm. We all have to deal with it. Those are the rules of this game. So how do you balance them? Well, let me just finish the soul, just get through to these ones, Mm -hmm. and then we'll get to that. So soul-dominant people, they knew their purpose. Like I I was given mine, right, early, four years old. Soul-dominant people. That's why I I respond to stress like a spirit-dominant. And by that, I mean... Uh, I want to go home now. (laughs) My soul keeps me here. My soul, you know, I go back in here. So anytime I have those feelings of, I want to go home now, I don't like it here, it's harsh and abrasive. I go over here. I go over here. I say I'm not body dominant, but I run four miles every other day and I lift weights, you know, Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I can be buff and everything. But do I want to play in a body dominant game of rugby, basketball? No. You know why? Because it's rude. Stealing somebody's ball away while they're still (laughs) playing it, it's rude. (laughs) It doesn't suit my mouth. Like, you know, here we are. Yeah. Tackle them. It's rude. Sure. Fair enough. So the thing is, we end up in a culture Like I was giving this presentation to teachers because I'm teaching this to teachers a lot because to recognize the kids in their classroom. You can see who the body dominant kids are. You can see who the mind dominant kids are. Are you seeing these ones? Mm -hmm. And what you really want to watch out for with these kids, when you see that their eyes go dim, like dead eyes, because then their spirit's out, it's gone. How do you get that spirit back in for them? Mm. So I used to watch out for that in my classroom. And then I got, uh, because the kids knew about this model, and I went over to this one boy. He had his hoodie on with his earbuds in and everything. He was a pale, ethereal kid. And I said to him one day, dragged my chair over, and I said, hey, listen, where do you go when you get sick of us? And he just looked at me, and, and he had light in his eyes for the first time. And he said, I build skateboard parks. I said, do you? Okay. And I got out a journal book for him. I said, okay, do you ever get formulas? Do you ever get pictures of this coming in for you? Yeah, I do. Well, let's put it in this journal book. And I said, well, what does your time schedule look like? Are you taking physics? Because you're going to need that for the ramps. Are you taking math, calculus, so that you can get all of those? Can you get, are you taking drafting, art? Because they need to be beautiful. Um, And so suddenly his schooling became relevant. And I said, you don't need to escape because it's their spirit world, Alex, that they're mm-hmm. escaping. Right. Daydre- I, that would be another word to be daydreaming. I don't think of it that way because if your spirit can come out when you're, when you die, mm-hmm. like you have a year near death or when you die, it comes out, it can come out right now. Yeah, of course. No, of course. But when I say is like, when I remember, 
you know, just daydreaming or going to another place yeah. in class because I hated yeah. school, despised it when I was in high school. Loved it yeah. in college, despised yeah. it in high school because yeah. I didn't see any relevance to it. I would be I would be in the land of movies because that's what I that was my path was filmmaking. So I was constantly living in that place and going off and figuring out things in regards to story and things like, and, and it just was where I went. So I, you know, you could, I, I would interchange the two words, you know, mm -hmm. you know, potato, potato, but like, yeah, it doesn't really matter. doesn't really matter, but they go somewhere else. They go somewhere. Yes. Else. You go There's somewhere some, else. You're, you're yeah. somewhere else. I think everybody yeah. at one point or another has been in the room and their eyes yeah. just go dead and they're just, and someone goes, Hey, where, where did you go? And like, Oh, yes. I was in a much better place than I am right now. I know exactly. But here's the thing for me is that um, when I send, when I, my spirit goes places, people see me there. Mm. So I remember I had a friend who was traveling through Mexico and this was pre cell phone days. And I don't even think he'd have a cell phone today, even, mm. you know, even now, cause he wasn't that kind of, he liked being off into the wilderness mm -hmm. and he was driving through Mexico and um, so anyway, I thought, I wonder how he's doing. So I took my spirit out and I got, I found him. He was in his car. And uh, so I said, hey, how are you doing? Then he found a phone booth like two days later. He said, you scared me. Like I was driving along, like the dust coming out the back. And I heard this, how are you doing? I looked and there you were sitting in the back seat of my car. So I actually do send my spirit places and people see me there. I have a number it, of stories. So like astro, like astro projection. Well, yeah, except they see me there. So my spirit can come out and it goes place. I taught my son how to do that because he uh, was hit by a car and he became really kind of OCD about things and mm -hmm. really fearful of death. And and uh, he, uh, I told, sh showed him how to take his spirit out because he was worried about me. I was going to die. And I said, just take your spirit out, get inside me and look out my eyes and then you'll see where I am. And I taught him that. And he's, he's been able to do that. Okay. Um, but if we look at, say, spirit dominant, soul dominant, and then oneness, my that same son I'm talking about taught me so much about oneness. Mm. And I'll tell you how he did that. So he was um, three, and uh, I was putting him to bed, and he was such a cute little kid. And so I was putting him to bed, and he said, you know, Mom, before I was born, I was talking to God. And I said, really? Well, what does God look like? looks like white, mm. looks like white, but you know, you're talking to God. And this is before my near death experience, my second one. It looks like white, but you know, it's God. And I said, well, what could, did God tell you? God told me I had to come down and be a human. I said, really? Well, what did you say? And he said, well, I told him I didn't want to come. Well, why not? Well, because it's so nice over there, mom. And it's not nice here. <laughs> not nice here. And I said, did you tell God that? And he said, yeah, I did. And I said, well, show me a picture of my mom. Show me my mom, he said. Show me, a, show me my mom. And he took a picture of you. And he, it was like out of a photo album. And he took a picture and showed it to me. And I said, oh, I don't want to be her son because she looks mean. I'm keeping all my feelings to myself. <laughs> <laughs> said I said um, to him uh, really um, well so what did God say to that he said I had to come and so I got inside your body and then when I was born I looked at your face and I said oh you're so beautiful and I'm glad you're my mom but he was born dead because he was feet first and he had the cord all wrapped around his oh, wow. neck and he was born like they whisked him out and then I could hear, you know, come on, baby, breathe, come on, baby, breathe. And so they brought him back. So I think that conversation happened. So he's uh, so when we talk about uh, do you choose to come in? He was an obedient spirit. Mm -hmm. He came in because God did he want to come? No. Did he want to face all the hardship, the meanness down here? No. Well, but he you came because God told him to come. Well, you know what's interesting? We were talking before we got on the show about uh, you you saying you wanted to have an A plus life review. Oh yeah, yes, and, I do. And 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 then as I and when you said that, I the first thing that came to me was, well, 
what is the definition of an A plus life review? Is it something that you do perfect, that you had a perfect life and you did everything perfectly? Is that A plus? Because I would consider that a fail as opposed to a life of struggle and overcoming different obstacles in your life and challenges in your life and making it to the end. That I consider an A plus. So a lot of people listening might under, might have the same feelings as you have. Like, I want to have a great life review. I'm like, yeah, I want well, a really great one. And what? when I go over there, Alex, because I've heard this voice talking to me my whole life. Mm-hmm. When I go over to the other side and I do my life review, I'm really hoping that I hear. Thank you, Margo. You did. It makes me cry a little bit, actually. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Margo. You did everything I asked. Or Thank everything you. or everything that you set out to do. Well, I mean, I heard I was to be a teacher. I had this really cool job when I was at university where I was like, uh, you know, I was working in a hotel, like to make lots of money to go to university. And uh, and they said, oh, we'll put you in the hotel management. We'll send you all over. Couldn't. That wasn't I your said, path. I promised at four that I would be a teacher. Well, that was your test. That was a test. Probably was my test. Yeah. And so, yeah, I see everything as a test. Well, and some people say there are no tests. Well, we get challenges, and um, but this this child of mine here, he taught me a lot about oneness because he he re- and when he told me that I I said I've really got to make school a place an educational space for kids to grow into creating the life their spirit came here to live. Mm-hmm. Isn't that what the purpose of school is? Should be whatever. Well, we are in one big school in general, Earth School. Well, we are here. <laughs> We're required by law to go off to this school. Yeah. So and then my son now is like seven. So I take him off to the, my three kids. We're off in a museum. Well, he had fallen in love with Buddha at seven. So he was, here he is. There he is. He's like Buddha posing it all over. Oh, the place. how beautiful. He's seven. So anyway, um, we're in a museum. He, I see him. He's sitting in front of the Buddha in exactly the Buddha pose. And the other kids are saying, Mom, do you want us to get Alex? No, no, no. Just leave him there. My son's also Alex. Um, uh, just leave him there. And when he's finished his experience, he can catch up. We'll just stay. So anyway, he caught up. And I said, Alex, how was your experience with Buddha? And he said, well, you know, Mom, to understand something, you must become that thing. He's seven. (laughs) He's seven. That's amazing. So that is oneness. Yeah. To understand something. At a deep, deep, deep Become that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So when we look at this again, so, you know, that voice gave me this model. But what happens is when we're stressed. So imagine when we're stressed here. What do body dominant people do when they're stressed? shop, maybe steroids, Eat. maybe uh, all that um, uh, Ozempic, mm-hmm. oh, God. Um, yeah. you know, uh, plastic surgery. Mm. Is that a whole industry preying on body dominant people's fear of aging? All the materialism over here. What do mind dominant people? They live a very systematic, structured, logical life. What do they do when they're stressed out? My system's not working. Or maybe their partner passes away and they had an idea of what their retirement, their whole old age, and now everything's changed, right? But they can micromanage Mm. because they have to get everybody back into the system. And some of them go around calling other people idiots. Look at all the idiots on the road. Oh, idiots, idiots, idiots. My friend did this. We were driving in a car and she was calling everybody an idiot. And uh, she looked at me finally. I bet you think I'm stressed. Kind of do. You know, not everybody's an idiot. But it's really about recognizing when you talked about balancing, Mm -hmm. recognizing when you're out of balance, go to another dimension. So my, I get people into, you know, who want to open up their soul dimension because they've retired now. So their whole mind dominant existence of career is gone. Yeah. So where do they go next? Over here. Some of them are over here. They want to explore what is the life my spirit wanted to live. I never liked that career in the first place. 
So they mm-hmm. want to explore what is the life my spirit wants to live. These kids here, well, people here who are spirit dominant, and you were in the film business, we can see some uh, real spirit dominant actors. A few, absolutely. You know, and, and acting is a really good, in some ways, a great space for them because they have a script, they've got markers where they have to stand and then when they're done, and they can let the, sp- the spirit of that character in and guide them, but it's really also difficult for them when they can't let go of that spirit that they're... It is, it, it, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with Oscar winners, and I've had a pleasure of talking to a lot of these, these high-performing artists, and it's really interesting because you're absolutely right. I've spoken to some of the rock stars and uh, movie stars and artists in general the great ones, writers and so on, the great ones understand that they are a vessel. They get it. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some who are that are so gifted, they could stay in the body and the mind because they've been blessed with this obscene gift mm-hmm. that uh, that they later find. But the greats, the Meryl Streeps of the world, who Every time you see her play any character, she just encompasses that character in a way that nobody else can. Or Daniel Day-Lewis. These kind of deep, deep artists, they they are spirit dominant, no question, and arguably soul dominant as well to be allowed that. And they've said it to me. Writers, you know, some Oscar winning writers, they go, yeah, I just show up and I'll write and then I'll look back and I'll read it and go, well, that was good. Who wrote that? Um, and I think we all have a little bit of that in our in in our in our life, hopefully sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. But even athletes I've spoken to, they are when they get in the zone, they are body dominant because they're athletes. But when they connect to spirit while being in body dominant, which is that zone, they don't even think anymore. They just do. And it's kind of the oneness too, because Correct. you can see like. There, you know, when you see a violinist mm-hmm. and now they're completely like they're in another world. They're, they're lost there. in they're the gone. oneness of that total connection to the instrument. And the really great basketball players, they're oh. in this flow of oh. oneness. You read my they mind. <laughs> know where that basket is, they know where every player is. And so, really, to develop your oneness over here. Mm-hmm will really help you elevate where you are in your life. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Pardon me? How do you do that? Well, you know, I was um, out running and there's somebody who practices piano every morning on this, Mm -hmm. on my route. And you can hear that it's a mind dominant person playing piano because it's really quite technical. You know, they know they're watching the notes. It's very like this. They need to loosen up and breathe and connect up into oneness. I used to teach my students how to do that in their writing. Um, So when they had to, because some of the kids would come to me and they didn't know how to write. And I said, well, okay, I want you to look at this word now, like the question. And it'd always be some word like, how does fear work? They'd be some big philosophical question. And I'd say, okay, what I want you to do is sit back in your chair and close your eyes. And I want you to see, I want you to see the word fear. And then I want to, I want you to, the very first images you see, like a movie, what are you seeing? Which story have we studied that would match what you're seeing the best? Start writing down what, what the movie you're seeing in your head. That's where you start your essay. And those, the kids had tremendous marks on these big provincials that I didn't have to mark Mm -hmm. uh, because they were all standardized, but they, they used to do, and people would say, it's so funny because you can see one row of students from one teacher and they're all like drafting it all out, mind mapping and all of this. And then you look down your row and yours, yours open up their booklet and then they all sit there like this. (laughs) Meditating. (laughs) Meditating to get the answer. Cause I showed them how, I showed them how to have a vision so that they could pull this really fresh, vibrant answer down. It is a teachable skill. We, I was going to say, this is something that so many people listening might not understand, but everybody has this ability. 
sure. Like and I've said this before, everybody can play basketball. You could take a ball, you could throw it up, but we're not all Michael Jordan. So some are more gifted than others in this space, but we can all do it and grow in that, in this, this technique, this idea, because I've learned how to do it, you know, meditating myself and allowing certain things to come in. Um, the name of this show came in a meditation. I asked for it. Mm -hmm. I said, I need a name for this show. I had three weeks to put the show together because <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I was given marching orders. And, and, and I said, okay, I need a name. And it came, just popped right into my head during a meditation. And I checked. I was like, oh, nobody else has this name. No one else is using this. Great. And it just popped in. But you learn these skills. It's nothing I did. I wasn't born with like you and this mm -hmm. wonderful supportive family and educated and in spirit. I wasn't, it was a longer, tougher road for me. And that the one thing I wanted to talk about real quick is the, the five, the five uh, profiles. You figured out a few of these much earlier than others, because that's your path. Mm -hmm. For me, I didn't discover my true purpose up until really probably around five years ago. So this when I discovered my purpose. And then when I discovered it and I truly understood what the purpose was, everything just fell into place. And then all, all the other things around me started to make sense to me. And I, when I got to that soul place, I was like, oh, okay. And I, I get it now. All the struggles, all the hardships, all the long roads that I went to to get to this place was all being designed for me to get to this place at this moment, not five years ago, not 10 years ago, and not 10 years from now. This is the moment where you needed to learn it in your life and everything started to open up. So for people listening, don't feel like you're a failure if you haven't figured it out yet. Everyone's path is completely different. But, under, but if you're listening to this, you're already on the path because you're asking the questions. Well, we're all part of a soul group. We're interested in this kind of thing. Correct. Mind dominance might not be listening. They might think it's all woo-woo business, you know? Correct. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, yeah, mine came in this way. And there are a whole bunch of things I can't do, like read a map. Oh, I can't either. <laughs> no, I like somebody told me, and this was only like a few years ago, like I drew a map about how to get somewhere and they said, so it's north up here. And I said, what do you mean? Well, this must be north because you put it at the top. Oh, no, you come out my place and you turn left. <laughs> well, that must be north. No. Oh, you know, I have no idea. Like some of the things that are like kind of of this world are just baffling. Yeah. And I'm so ethereal, like, you know, trying to get a lid off a jar or something, and then some body dominant comes by and just go, Grrr. I'm like, how did you do that? I fall down on ice. We're, it's quite icy here um, in March with the melt and everything. I have to be really careful because I'm a spirit dominant. I'll fall down where you see these body dominant people like crunk, crunk, crunk through the ice and they don't slip. But there are all kinds of things. You know, we're all here, like we're eternal beings. Mm. And sometimes like, if you're a body dominant person, like it's easy. It, oh, I shouldn't say it's easy, but it's like certainly very fun. Oh. Like for, for like so many times when I was over here, like wanting to go home and I decided I was going to make earth my home, I had to open up my body dimension of self. I became, I like I have parties now. I had one last week. I love parties. I love all the food, the candles, the flowers. I Because body dominance told me, like they said, no, Marco, you're missing the whole point of your life if you're not going to enjoy the whole tangible side of things. Sure. Um, you know, and then my, so I turn it on and turn it off. So I run, I exercise, I get my hair cut. I turn that on. And then mind I turn that, it's tax season, right? We have to have them in by May 1st. So that means I have to turn on my mind and get all my tax stuff all put together. Um, so I turn it on, but do I want to work in a mind-dominant career? No. I, I just don't want to. 
Mm -hmm. I'm too spirit and soul. Like I have to work Mm -hmm. only in things that match my soul purpose, which is to teach people about this Mm -hmm. and to help them create the unconditional love and peacefulness so that they can create the life their spirit came here to live. That's my whole purpose in life. And to be on a personal note, that's, that makes so much sense because I've been an artist all my life and artists are generally leaning much more towards spirit than body or mind because art is not an intellectual process. So some try, but it doesn't work that way. Art is a completely, I think, very spiritual process. So even when I was working throughout my life, everything always had to be in the artist. And anytime I tried to skew from that, it just didn't, it didn't work. It didn't work. I was always, when I was in this artistic aspect of it. And I consider what I do now in many ways, a a next level of that, because there is an art to what we do and how we present it, but it is much more connected to soul and to oneness than definitely not body and mind. Uh, Though there is some intellectual conversations as we've had here as well, but the intellectual is, I think, a gateway into the spirit because it walks you in and you go, well, wait a minute. She has a PhD from Oxford. She's not a loon. So what is that? And then you start, it starts opening doors into the spirit. That's which, which I hope to do with these conversations. Well, and you know, being an educator and I speak to uh, teachers across the country, um, like a PhD is a valued thing in my, my soul field, right. To be Mm -hmm. able, like when I, when I came up with this book, I was speaking at like to medical doctors and Mm -hmm. psychiatrists. I didn't want to get up there and say, hi, I'm Margot McKinnon, high school English teacher. As proud as I was of that. uh, I wanted to say I'm Dr. Margot McKinnon. And I really do look at the whole uh, scientific part of this. I mean, there's so many brain, you had a neurologist on like brain scans, genetic studies, uh, quantum Uh, physicists, of course. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like all of that, it's 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 sitting right there. And some people say to me, well, have you proven scientifically your theory, Margo? Can you be out there? Sci-? And I said, you know what, here's the thing. I'm not out here to convince anybody of anything. I'm here to support people who are having spiritual experience. Mm. I'm here to support them so that they want to stay here. Because mm. I've worked with too many people who want to go home now. And this model really helps them. I'll say, you know what, let's work on your oneness, your sense of connection and belonging. And you are connected to something bigger. Don't check out early. Mm. Stay, stay, stay with us. And my job as your high school English teacher is I'm going to help you explore all of this so that you find a real meaning. And, And once we did that, it's about getting their voice and where they are in their life. Oh, their marks just went skyrocketed Mm -hmm. and the light was in their eyes. So, you know, and we are eternal beings. If your life here is, um, is about enjoying the whole physical tangible part, go for it. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's, that's what your journey is. Excellent. Can you bring me with you? Can you invite me to your parties? Cause I love, I love them. Right. If your uh, experience here is to do uh, a lot of mind things, you love all the puzzles. Like this is how, when I was teaching, we had to go to graduation ceremonies. So I had my black gown on and the kids had their blue one on. And I was sitting by my physics teacher friend. And I always carried a piece of paper and a pen under my gowns in case I had a vision while, while something was happening. So anyway, uh, I'm sitting beside my friend. And uh, so he whips out his piece of paper from under his gown. And he's like this. Now, I, I at the same time was whipping out mine and I was writing on my piece of paper. And then we put it. And, and, I, and then when the, the kids were all like clapping for some kid, I said, hey, what were you working on? And he said, I had this math problem. It's bugged me for a week. I solved it. And mind dominant guy, right? And I said, but also kind of visionary because m- math is visionary. Also. Oh, very much. Um, you know, so then he said, what were you working on? I, mean, I had a vision. Great. Let's meet after. We'll talk about our visions. And that's the kind of people I worked with. And the, they gravitated toward me because sure. I always create the space for people to be real about their spiritual experience. And you want to hear something funny. Ever since I launched the show, that's happened to me because people start to, people who find me 
uh, either through the show or in, in the world out there, they were like, can we talk about simulation theory and, and that we're all in this simulation and, and what does that mean spiritually and all that? And they and people from Hollywood will call me and they'll go, hey, can we can we, you know, can we just talk about this episode you did? Because I can't say anything publicly about it, which is something I wanted to ask you. How do you find the courage to be spiritual in our current Western world? Because in other in other countries, it's a lot more acceptable, like in India and, and other areas like that, that it's that's just part of the culture. But for mm-hmm. us, it is not. And nowadays, even worse so, the word God is a triggering, is a trigger word for God's sakes. So now people have to say the universe or source, which is fine. You call it whatever you want. Yeah. Um, but, you know, to just say the word spirit, I was terrified of this doing this show because of that. Because career of the, suicide. Career suicide. So how mm-hmm. do you approach that if, if someone's listening? Okay. Well, first of all, when I would go to job teacher interviews to get a job, Mm-hmm. So why did you want to become a teacher? Okay. <laughs> did you lead with the with the giant being that came in in your vision? I, uh, I, I actually said, I've always wanted to be a teacher. However, I went to Oxford and my my supervisor and I said, I said, well, how would you like to be me having to sit there in a job interview? Why did you? Am I supposed to sit there going, well, I heard this voice that told me you are to, like, I would never get the job, right? However, uh, all the way through high school, like, because it was so natural to me, Alex, what was I supposed to do? I don't even know any different. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything different. Mm -hmm. So it was always just a natural thing. And then um, all my friends in high school always knew, my university friends, anybody I worked with always knew. And uh, so I just became that person that, you know, my door's open. You can talk to me about anything. But how about for somebody who's not as lucky as you are in this life, in that sense, that didn't have that path, that is feeling, you know, listening to this show and wants to have more spirituality in their life and maybe even talk about it besides just listening to this show? Well, I'd say hang in there because finding friends that uh, are supportive, you only really need one friend, Uh, but having friends, finding meetup groups, listening to podcasts, podcasts like yours, and it's just becoming more normalized now. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, but you know, my, I have a, a brother and two sisters, right? So my brother is an engineer. And I hope, I don't know if he's going to watch this podcast, but anyway, he's, he retired. Um, and uh, from engineering. And so now guess what? He's oh, opening oh. up all of this side <laughs> because he has the time, right, to open up all of this side. And so he phones me up. He lives in Toronto. He phones me up to have conversations about, uh, you know, these, I just think I had a vision. Does this sound like a vision to you? <laughs> an engineer, really, an engineer, no less. An yeah. engineer. And I love it, right? So I, I just, you know, I am who I am. I don't, unapologetically i don't um, i'm not trying to convince anybody i just am if you like me great and if you don't 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 hang out with me it's i'm okay. okay with that right i'm okay with my fam my dad saying uh, you'll commit career suicide if you do that um and then when i sent him my first copy of my book and i sent it he, he got the first copy and um he read it and he said i'm so glad you didn't listen to me me too <laughs> not to write it because it's helped so many people. Sure. So yeah, not everybody's going to like you. It's I okay. mean, it it trust me, it's on okay. what job you have. I mean, that my students used to say, aren't you worried that maybe somebody's going to come and arrest you because you let us tell your our ghost stories in here? And I said, oh, you'll see me on the front of the newspaper with my hands in handcuffs. Yeah, you want to know why I'm being arrested? Because we talked about the great questions of the human experience. And that's what literature is all about. Margo, it has been such a wonderful conversation with you. I'm going to ask you a few questions, ask all my guests. What is your definition of living a fulfilled life? A fulfilled life? Well, it's partly I want my A plus on my judgment day. Obviously. And I, obviously. It's a teacher in you. That, <laughs> yes. And I, and I really want God to be proud of me mm-hmm. and thankful and, and say, thank you, Margo. You put yourself out there made some sacrifices. I appreciate that. A fulfilled life is really my, 
accessing all my five dimensions. I love to wake up in the morning to a peaceful, lovely day where I get to live the life my spirit came here to live. Fun, uh, friends, kindness, unconditional love. How do you define God? That great force of oneness that uh, connects all of us. And as my son said, to understand something, you must become that thing. So it's that oneness that connects all of us. We're all related. And what is the ultimate purpose of life? I think you nailed it earlier when you were talking about all of our lessons. Mm. Take everything as a lesson. Right now, I, I have a meeting tonight where it's going to get quite contentious. And I'm the, kind of the board chair of it. Mm -hmm. And I know it's going to get contentious. And I do a white light meditation, sometimes two and a half hours in the morning and an hour before bed. And I say to the force of oneness, God, creator, and I say, thank you for bringing me an opportunity to practice handling a difficult situation well. So everything, any kind of conflict I have, I say, thank you for giving me another chance to practice. So what is my, what was the question? Like my purpose or the my- The ultimate purpose of life. The ultimate purpose is to- be conscious of these lessons that you're getting and being grateful for them, that you handle them better and better every time. And where can people find out more about you and the amazing work you're doing? You can go to my website, which is www.drmargomckinnon.com, uh, D-R-M-A-R-G-O-T, McKinnon. Um, and, uh, they can go and check out all my, I run a meetup group where we do ask the universe. We do once a month, ask the universe because I ask the universe, anything I want to know, I go and ask. So we have a meetup group where we, I, uh, I, we have a question and then we all have to ponder it for the whole month. Mm -hmm. I go in and get my answers and then we come together and share all our answers once a month. So we do that and I run webinars. And of course my book here, if they want to order one right off my website. And do you have any parting messages for our audience? If you know of anyone who's struggling being human, if you can just hold their hand and if you can get them a copy of this and just say, just hold their hand and life will get better. If they just understand that there's such an exquisiteness about staying here. Because I think that's really why I'm down here is to help people understand this is a wonderful place to live. Margo, thank you again so much for this conversation. And I hope it truly helps people listening to it around the world. So I appreciate you, my dear. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Bye. Thanks for watching. Click on one of the videos below to continue your journey. And don't forget to subscribe.